Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Patrick Reavy. I am a physician at uh, plastic surgeon, hand surgeon at the University of Rochester Medical Center in New York. So today we'll be doing mostly extremity related stuff. Uh, we'll starting uh, starting with hand surgery. Um, for this, you know, there's nothing more awkward than trying to give a presentation via Zoom to a uh, blank audience. But so feel free to interrupt either verbally um, unmuting yourself or at the chat to ask questions throughout the talk. You don't have to necessarily wait till the end. Um, and there will be some uh, example questions during the presentations. You guys are welcome to uh, try to answer again either way. Um, but first, I'll just sort of go through some general test taking uh, strategy or my advice on it. I take it, you can take it or leave it. But um, you have to remember, I think that people wrote these questions trying to hopefully test a specific point or thing that you should um, take away from plastic surgery. Um, and so I think there's different, I would break down the question types into different types of questions. So there's the memorization questions that literally just have to do with you either know the anatomy or you don't. Um, and uh, some of these, or if you know the receptor mutation or you don't, some of these are, are first order, second order, third order, depending on how uh, detailed the vignette is. Um, Embryology is a big one, growth factors, et cetera. And then if there's a clearly defined pathology or treatment for a particular condition, um, which is uh, somewhat rare, but um, you know, there's also the best treatment question. And I, I think the key thing and the mistake that uh, most people often do is do not think about what you would do uh, unless you are very clearly uh, only following evidence-based medicine. Um, do not think about what you've seen in your training because I wouldn't necessarily say that that is always the right answer specifically for the test, although in clinical practice, it may be the best. But you, if you think about the best treatment for certain conditions, you can usually narrow it down to two options and then you get yourself a 50-50. Remember, this is evidence-based for general plastic surgeons. And so, um, I, again, uh, try to outsmart the test writer, not uh, don't let them outsmart you. Um, in terms of pictures, x-rays and stuff, um, in my experience, the, the quality of the pictures is sometimes variable. The monitors aren't necessarily the best. Um, but the key thing is if they're showing you a picture or an x-ray, it should be pretty obvious what the finding is. It's not gonna be subtle. Um, so if there's tendon exposed, um, you know, the tendon will clearly be exposed. If there's a obvious fracture, there should be obvious fracture. Or if there's obvious arthritis, there'll be obvious arthritis. Um, at the same time, they always have a vignette that has some of the details, especially for the hand surgery questions. And it may be enough information in the vignette to answer without the picture. And then finally, there's the read my mind or read my paper. Um, remember, this, the, the authors have to prov provide several references for each answer and or right question. Um, but that could mean that they reference their own um, level four papers. So that's just the reality of how it is. Um, but, uh, and, and that means that sometimes you, there, there's something you get wrong. In terms of strategy, I think the key thing is find what works for you. But I would say, especially for the hand surgery section is read the vignette, read every word of the vignette. Um, don't try to skip through. Some people like to look at the answers first and then read the vignette second. Um, but, um, I, you know, I would, uh, if you want to look at, read the vignette, then guess the answer before looking at the options or look at all the options then pick the best to look at all the options or eliminate wrong and pick the right one. Um, that's fine. But the key thing is read all the details of the vignette because the answer can change on one particular detail. So really look at all the options. Um, and read the vignette. Um, again, you can try to reverse engineer this. Um, again, this is supposed to be evidence-based. It's supposed to test a key area or aspect of plastic surgery. So if we're talking about hand arthritis or the uh, treatment for different types of arthritis, then um, 
usually you're going to be on the division between a key decision factor or our treatment paradigm. So for like slack wrist, whether or not you can do a PRC or a four corner fusion. Um, and then, you know, in terms of, let's say, reconstructive stuff um, in general or in other sections, if someone is sick, they're going to sound really sick in the vignette. If someone is crazy, they're going to sound very crazy. If a wound needs a flap, it will clearly need one. If a finger is not replantable, it will clearly not be replantable. Um, so here's just an example of uh, some examples where vignette is um, uh, important. So as a 52 year old man is scheduled to undergo operative release of the A1 pulley, for stenosis tenus and of the A1 finger, uh, read of the right hand after two injections of corticosteroids, which of the following is the most likely to be useful in locating the proximal edge of the A1 pulley. So this is more of a complete memorization question. You think trigger finger, oh great, I got this one. Um, but the answer is the uh, distance from the pro proximal digital crease to the proximal interphalangeal crease. Why they thought that was the most important thing to ask, ask about a um, trigger finger, I'm not sure, but that's what they decided to test. Here is um, a, another patient, um, also another trigger finger question. So a 76 year old woman with rheumatoid arthritis comes to the office because of a two month history of difficulty flexing the index finger of the left hand. She says that when the, she flexes the finger, a painful snapping sensation occurs. Physical examination shows fullness of the flexor tendon at the level of A1 pulley, which is the following is the most appropriate surgical treatment. And these are your choices. Release of the A1 pulley, release of the A1 pulley and stair step expansion of the pulley, removal of the entire FDS tendon, routing of the A1 pulley under the flexor tendons and synovectomy and debridement of the flexor tendons. So if you looked at the, the correct answer here is synovectomy and debridement of the flexor tendons. And the key detail, unless you, if you didn't read every word of the question, you missed the rheumatoid arthritis part, um, that would basically throw you in the wrong direction. So here's a key example where really just taking the time to read every word of the vignette is worth it. So moving on, these are the most commonly tested topics, at least on the in-service, plastic surgery in-service, which is a good correlation to, I think, the board's um, um, but these are the most commonly tested, pretty reliable that you'll get a question on these topics. Dupuytren's tendon injuries, rheumatoid arthritis, replantation or hand trauma, CRPS, hypothene or hammer, flexor tendon or reconstruction, compression syndrome, so that'd be the carpal tunnel, cubital tunnel, and then the congenital hand issues, especially syndactyly. There's a lot of uh, soft tissue recon. Much of it is fingertip. Um, they talk about Volkman's contracture. The uh, test writers love and chondromas. Uh, constriction band syndrome is another congenital issue. And then scaphoid fractures, basal joint arthritis, and, and another thumb, uh, thumb hypoplasia. So we'll start first by going through uh, anatomy and pathophysiology. So this will cover a lot of the uh, memorization questions that may come up. And we'll start with tendons and tendon stuff. So remember your extensor tendon apparatus is uh, quite complicated. You have your central slip, which attaches to the dorsal aspect of the middle phalanx, extends your PIP joint, but there are contributions from the central slip to the lateral bands and the lateral bands to the central slip. And then you they continue on as the terminal tendon um, to extend the, the lateral bands continue on as the terminal tendon to extend the uh, DIP joint. There's also the triangular aponeurosis that hold the two lateral bands in the uh, dorsal uh, region. And in red on the lateral side is the oblique retinacular ligament of Landsmere, which sometimes uh, comes up for um, um, uh, swan neck deformity. Um, but the, um, <clears throat> or sorry, boutonniere deformity. I've never seen it in clinical practice, but they do like to ask questions on it. But it is a sort of passive structure that helps with a passive uh, tenodesis of the DIP joint. But the key thing is to know the anatomy and know which ones do what, because it can help you sort of figure out the, both um, the answers for questions, but also in clinical practice. So the um, EDC, so your, uh, ex, your extrinsic form extens, uh, extensors of the fingers, extensor digital communis or your EIP or EDQ for 
the index and small finger, they primarily will extend your MCP joint. So they're the primary extenders of your MCP joints. The um, central slip will extend obviously your PIP joint um, and we'll have, uh, because there's the slight contribution to the lateral bands, you can have some slight extension of the DIP joint. The lateral bands um, go on the volar aspect of your uh, MCP joint. And so they are the primary flexors of the MCP, MCP joint, but then they also will extend the PIP and are the primary extenders of the DIP joint. The triangular ligament holds the lateral bands in the dorsal position. And there's a transverse ligament, which will, um, which stabilizes the lateral bands in their relative volar position. And as we mentioned, the oblique retinacular ligament of Landsmere uh, is involved in tenodesis of the DIP joint with extension of the PIP joint. So these, all the structure comes into play with some of the classic uh, injuries that we, um, C and they like to test. So a mallet finger is the forced flexion of a extended finger at the DIP joint and you can have a rupture um, or avulsion of the terminal extensor tendon. It can be with or without a fracture. It can be open or closed. If it is closed and there's no fracture, then the primary treatment is an extension splint for a minimum of six weeks. The key thing is you leave the PIP free you have to watch for skin irritation and or necrosis on the dorsal aspect of the finger because the thin is quite um, thin there. And the key thing is they sometimes like to test is that if you have a chronic untreated mallet based on the chronic um, change in the relative tension of the flexors and extensors, you can end up with a swan neck deformity. Um, if you 